Hello, all you textual deviants, and welcome to yet another episode of Texting with me, Tomek, in St. Petersburg. And with me, Mark Will, in Taipei. I'm wondering, should we engage in some banter? Do you think our listeners would like us to bullshit a little bit before we jump into the text? Or do you think most textual textual deviants just want to get straight to the text? It's funny because I was just thinking about that today, and uh, I thought if there was going to be any banter, it could relate to the emergence of spring, which is like official now here as of yesterday i would say it's like very pronounced oh. you know you can really feel like okay this is spring and that's kind of interesting for me just how there's this like border that is very clear at least in a place like this so i'm massively excited despite the fact that i know i'll suffer from allergies for a while but uh it's just gonna make all the difference in terms of just being able to be outside and enjoy walking around so winter the weather is in officially Taipei? over Winter yeah, the, we won't have over. any snow. We won't have any more snow. And, uh, you know, St. Petersburg could be a top 10 world city if the weather is like this. Like when the weather is good in St. Petersburg, it's just amazing because it's so yeah. pedestrian friendly, beautiful. Um, everybody's outside. So it's it's the other six months of the year that are a struggle. Hmm. Well, unfortunately, I'm planning to visit in the winter, so that's <laughs> every that's, season has its charm. Yeah, I, I mean, know, I, I know you're not I, averse to. No, I I can handle it because I've survived Korean winters. Uh, I don't know. Are they are they comparable? Or Russian it's winters colder, much worse? Of course, oh, of course. Okay. But it's nothing like a winter in. The region we'll be discussing today. Can we just use that as a segue and get into the? That's a episode? that's a great segue. <laughs> All right. So and let me let the, me say let please. me say before you introduce this topic. Sure. Uh, fantastic choice. I mean, I never would have known about this film had you not recommended it. Uh, and what a great experience it was to uh, learn about it and watch it. So I'm nice, really man. excited. I'm really excited. Let's get into well, it. Well, I will defer praise to my friend and uh, private student, Anna, uh, who works in film and told me about Yakutian cinema and kind of its emergence in the last 10 or so years. So we are discussing a film called Pugalo today, uh, which translates to Scarecrow. It's a 2020 film directed by Dmitry Davidov. And uh, it's described as a Yakut mystical drama. It won a major Russian award at the Kino Tavr Festival, which is like the largest national film festival. Um, it's currently on hiatus because of the political situation. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think it was a commercial success in Russia at all, but it did get some acclaim from critics and it did a somewhat humble tour of film festivals from just like what I was looking at today. So it, you know, it made it to, it was in a Palm Springs film festival. I think it was in Rotterdam, even somewhere in Canada, I believe. So, and it was, it was once hosted by the website MUE, MUBI. Do you know that website? No, it's, I'm not sure. It's I like, do. uh, it's like a Netflix for real film people. Okay. Uh, yeah, so like my buddy Joe, who's a film director, like swears by it, and they just tend to pick up films that are more artistic. So, so it's like an indie yeah. Netflix, exactly. And so it's M-U-B-I. I just mean that it's okay. M U B I. Yeah, I should find out what M U B I stands for. But anyway, well, so, okay, a couple a couple of things. I mean, that's yeah. a that's a really interesting descriptor, mystical drama. I I. That's the first time I'm hearing of this, but I think it's apt. I think it's appropriate since we may as well say it now. Uh, it's about shamanism, uh, a modern shaman in modern Russia, which is a fascinating topic. Um, and then the other thing I'd like you to do is explain what 
Yakuti is, since you, you mentioned, you know, the Yakuti film industry. Okay, I'll attempt to, and I only know a tiny bit more than you probably, but, and even in my, my preparation 10 minutes before the show, I just discovered that there's another name for that region, which is the preferred region. Maybe you came across this, but it's Saha or Saha. Yes, right. Okay, I so that. I don't know which the Republic, be using, but... the Republic of Saha. Exactly. But I've always known it as Yakutia, um, the capital of which is Yakutsk. And Russians know it as the coldest city in Russia. Um, the region itself is enormous, as I've discovered. It's the size of India, so it's, but it's just a small part of Russia. Um, the Far East, and uh, apparently in the last 20 years or so, yeah, this, this cinema has been really burgeoning and a lot of amateur filmmakers, but filmmakers who have an original vision. Uh, the director of this film was just working as a school director and he's self-taught. Um, but especially now with Hollywood being to some degree at least sanctioned, um, Yakutian films are kind of taking up the... The absence. I mean, I don't. I wouldn't say that Pugalo is necessarily representative of Yakutian cinema. I mean, I'm I'm guessing that a lot of their films are more commercially successful, probably more like mob films or you know things that are a bit easier for a mass audience. Because this film is pretty artsy and indie, I would say, and the feeling. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the last thing I'll say is just yeah, it's a city like Yakutsk is permanently situated on permafrost. And it's just a very uniquely cold experience. I had one colleague, Lorella, who worked there. She loved it. She said the people were very nice. But what an experience it is just as far as the the weather that you have to experience there. It's just, I mean, as I was watching this, I was just comparing life there to the kind of, the kind of life I've enjoyed in Italy at times. And I was just like, wow, the human experience, the human experience is so varied. And I can't believe so people like, yeah. yeah, and people to some degree, I mean, I know it's not really voluntary where we live, but you could say to some degree, people have a choice now of where they stay anyway. And the fact that people mm. in our day and age choose to live in a place that's just so hostile um, is interesting. It's not an easy life is my point. Yeah. Well, I, I read that Yakut, Yakut, is the world's coldest major city. So it yeah. has that reputation, mm -hmm. not only right. in Russia, but worldwide. Right. Population is 355,000 plus. So, you know, it's not huge, but uh, approaching half a million, more than a quarter of a million. So that's, that's a, the city, yeah? Of fairly, yeah, yeah. So that's a fairly decent sized uh, town. and. Uh, you know, the film for the most part takes place outside right. of Yakutsk, right? Like they talk about uh, going into the city. The but even that, that city is not Yakutsk. That's just like a, oh no, a, no, no. It's still a pretty oh. sized town. Oh, okay. I thought they were okay. So we're even further out in the sticks than absolutely. Than, uh, I thought. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So this is a very remote, desolate place. How do you, how do you know that the city in question is not Yakutsk? Is it, I just is it clear that no, I don't know hundred percent. No, but oh, okay, okay. it just seems like it, like, I just know that, you know, my wife is from a village and their idea of a town. Yeah. Is like still very, very small. So I'm assuming. I see. I see. Yeah. Well, one thing, you know, we're talking about diversity, the diversity of the human experience, but all of the characters in this film are ethnically, uh, ya what's the adjective? Yakut, Yakuti, Yakutian, 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 yeah. Yakutian. Yeah. And wow. I had no idea. I mean, it's like they, they looked to me like Koreans almost, you know, like that. And interestingly, their language I learned is a Turkic language influenced by 
Tunguzic and Mongolian languages. And, you know, the Korean language is very mysterious in terms of its origin, but it's thought to be related to Turkic languages. And I think I've heard the term Tunguzic, you know, uh, and Mongolian <clears throat> applied to Korean language influences as well, you know? So, I mean, didn't yeah, you get kind absolutely. of a Korean vibe from this? Like I, I thought of the, I thought of the uh, mudong that I saw on certain mountains in Korea, right? Like these, these lady shamans and sometimes they're men shamans, but I think the, the women are called mudong for some reason. Maybe that term is, applied to men as well. But like, I remember I stumbled upon some secret ceremony when I was hiking in Korea and, uh, Ooh, I was not welcome, man. It's like I had intruded on a sacred ceremony and I got the hell out of there pretty quickly. And, uh, I, I just felt like something very powerful and mysterious was taking place on that mountain. And we see similar things in this film, you know, mm. Just a quick couple of comments then regarding, first of all, yeah, the appearance. I teach one student at the moment uh, from Yakutia. His name is Vova or Vladimir. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, just a couple of days ago, my colleague said, oh, yeah, you know, Vova, the kid who looks more Chinese than a Chinese person. So I don't know. You know that's, oh, wow. He, it's not maybe yeah. the mo <laughs> most polite way of describing him, but yeah, he... he that Asian quality. And the other thing I wanted to mention is, you know, my wife is Tatar, which is also a language based on Turkic languages. And the neighboring province is called Bashkirtistan. So Tatarstan, Bashkirtistan, all of these languages originate in Turkic stuff. I mean, you articulate that better than I do. Um, well, but I just, I just mean, wanted to let you know a, that. That's another issue that came up for me as I was watching. It's like Russian federalism is amazing in its diversity, you know, like it, it's so vast. There's so many different ethnic peoples, you know, speaking different languages and maintaining their own native cultures and traditions. And yet they're unified by the Russian language to an extent, right? Like, uh, right, I sure, think this, sure. in this community, they're all speaking uh, Yakutian, right? Like all the time, but they know Russian too, don't they? Right. And there are a couple they scenes must. that do take place in Russian. I mean, I think 80% of the film is in Yakutian, but there are definitely a few scenes in Russian. Okay. Well, I didn't, yeah. I didn't even notice that because uh, there were, on the website, there were two choices. There was the Yakut version and the Russian version. I I clicked over to the Russian version and that was just like a dubbed movie. Right. I didn't I didn't even bother with that. I went back right. to the Yakut version with English subtitles, which right. you know gave me a more authentic feel for what was going on. But I get where where was the Russian dialogue? Like in the city? I can't remember. It could have been in the city or it could have just been a to kind of maybe for some of the younger generation, like, yeah, I think in general, you know, these languages are slowly diminishing and uh, Russian is kind mm -hmm. of becoming ubiquitous. Maybe not in all cases, but like in Liliana's case, for example, you know, you definitely see a decrease generationally, generationally between her and her mom and then her mom and, and her grandma. You see like mm. a, a steady decline in, in language proficiency of Tatar. Well, is she fluent in Tatar or not? So Liliana's much? not. No, she just understands a, de a decent amount. But like, well, her mom that's, and grandma you know, will speak Tatar back and forth. There you go. Well, there's a similar situation here on this island of Formosa, where I live. You know, like um, before the coming of Chiang Kai-shek and his army from the mainland, right? Uh, the so-called Chinese speakers here were speaking what's called Taiwanese, you know, like it's, it's not Mandarin, but then, uh, after, uh, the KMT, the party I've talked about before, I can't remember <clears throat> in what episode that came up, but 
You've heard me talk about them. That's Chiang Kai-shek's party from the mainland. So after they come here, you know, they impose these uh, really draconian uh, demands on the native population. And it's in the education system. Like children were punished. They would have to stand outside, outside with signs around their neck saying, I humiliated my family today because I spoke Taiwanese, you know, instead of Mandarin. So it was like beaten out of them. Of course, the older generation still uh, understands Taiwanese and speaks it. And there are popular like Taiwanese language soap operas and so on, but they're, they're always subtitles. And I think many, at least people of my age, Taiwanese people of my age, they understand Taiwanese because they've heard, you know, previous generations speaking it, but they they don't really speak it themselves. Mm. So I think it's a similar thing. Like there's a there's a a, a kind of a, what a linguistic tyranny imposed. I mean. I mean, yeah, language and politics. I don't know how so you many... feel about that. Is it, it is it good or bad? You know, like we could say the same thing goes on with English, of course, right? Like absolutely. And wh why is yeah, it just that, language and power are we... so intimately linked? Yeah, I mean, b before in the ancient world, it was Latin, right, because of the power of Rome, uh, and and now it's English because of British and American imperialism and so on. But uh, it sure makes things convenient in some ways, doesn't it? Like, especially for native English speakers. Yeah, absolutely. So but, uh, should we get okay. into like a, let's get into the movie, yeah? Maybe. Well, yeah. I mean, let me just pick up on something you mentioned before. Uh, the largely self-taught uh, director, uh I don't know. I, I certainly felt like he was not afraid to take chances. He didn't care about making a slick production. You know, this is supposedly a feature film, but it's only 70 minutes. So it's like, this is, this is the time that I need to tell the story. And that's it. Right. And if, if uh, you know, certain platforms don't accept me, because of that, so be it. I'll send it to film festivals, and if they like it, great. And if they don't, too bad. I mean, that's certainly to be admired. But even like in his technical uh, choices, there's a lot of shaky cam, you know. Long uh, shots, some which really I like. Long shots, yeah. Interesting uh, framing and angles. And did you notice the use of mirrors? Like there's one shot where we we see the 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 shaman doing her thing in the mirror rather than directly, and then later in the city when the <clears throat> when the lost daughter I don't know if this is a spoiler but the lost daughter appears we don't actually see her right we only see her in the window mm. of the guy talking to her remember that. Yeah, yeah. We should definitely discuss that subplot. Uh, so let me just give a tiny bit of background for listeners who haven't Don't seen know what the film. The hell we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. So just first of all, I will provide access to listeners using my Sylvia Films Online account. Uh, I don't think I'll get busted for that unless a million listeners use it. So. <laughs> For our... Which is likely, man. We're blowing up here at texting, so <laughs> be careful with that. But anyway, you're welcome to, listener, you're welcome to try out uh, my accounts to get access to this film because it will be tricky to find it otherwise. And we'll also, I'll give you a quick synopsis, so, which I can, I think, briefly read. There's a female healer or shaman, as Mark described her, uh, who's living in a desolate, uh, isolated village, and she's ostracized by the local population, but at the same time, many of them will covertly come to see her 
and ask her to heal a variety of conditions, um, everything from sexual impotence to a boy's stammer um, to other maladies, a variety. So, and at the, at the same time, many of her encounters in public are really brutal. She's harassed, bullied, um, at one point beaten up and, uh, and the film concentrates on, on her and her experiences. And, and she's really, she delivers a really powerful performance. Um, the, the actress's name was Valentina Romanova Chikarai, and, uh, she got some recognition and accolades for her, her portrayal of this healer. So I'll stop there, but, uh, well, let me comment Hopefully on that the, gives a little bit of a picture. Let it's me comment on the ostracism, right? Like she's she's ostracized until she's needed, right? She's ridiculed, mm -hmm. uh, as you say, bullied, publicly humiliated, spat upon, beaten up, um, and, and then often the same people who have harassed her come to her, as you say, covertly, secretively because they actually do believe in her powers, which are apparently legit. So that, I mean, there's that whole issue of charlatanry versus legitimacy, you know, like what, is it real or is it just some psychological uh, phenomenon taking place that allows her to heal these people? I mean, the, well, we're the clearly led to the, believe that it's, yeah, that it's working. It's successful. It's working. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, you know, I just thought about the social role of the healer or, you know, you could even extend that to like the Messiah that is always misunderstood, crucified, and then later worshipped, right? It's like, oh, oops, sorry, we fucking murdered you. You, you were actually our salvation. Or the artist, you know, who is ridiculed in his or her lifetime and then posthumously recognized as a genius or whatever mm -hmm. you know but the yeah but the portrait of her the portrait of this character is complicated by the fact that she's clearly an alcoholic you know like she's she goes on these uh vodka binges right mm -hmm. uh which seems like a very russian Thing to me, you know, stereo <laughs> stereotypically, right? Like Dostoevsky talks about the the influence of vodka on Russian culture, so you, we certainly see that here. And you know, as soon as she gets a little bit of money in her pocket, that's where she goes. You know, but to, I think to get a speaking bottle. direct, yeah, speaking to the vodka experience, we definitely see it differently than we might. Typically, imagine some you know some Russian guy with his pickles and and his mates. Like we kind of get the idea first of all that she's. I forgot about the pickles. I forgot about the pickles. Yeah, exactly. The crucial yeah. side dish. Right. But uh, yeah, she's clearly been traumatized by things in her past. We know that she's lost her daughter, and the way that she drinks the vodka. I mean, you could argue that alcohol is often sacramentalized. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah. in this case, it's absolutely so that, you know, she takes on, first of all, maybe we should also explain how she heals. So what she does, we don't exactly know, of course, the the chemistry of it, but yes. she, we know that she's taking on the pain and the suffering of each of her patients. And that after performing one of these healings, she generally becomes incredibly nauseous. She starts vomiting. It seems like the degree of the suffering that the patient has experienced is how much she will suffer. Yes. And the, the vodka is like a, a critical medicine um, and escape. It's like, so, a per, because, like a purgative, like a purgative. It helps her yes, absolutely. Vomit, up, vomit up the the pain that she took into herself. Man, as we're right. talking about this, I want to I watch it again. Like uh, you're bringing up some things that I hadn't thought about carefully i think i might watch this again it's so masterfully masterfully presented you know the life of this shaman and uh 
as you last thing I just wanted to say, sorry, just, I just thought it was really striking how she almost, at one point she kind of bathes herself in the vodka, right? Like she's, she's pouring it all over Mm -hmm. her, her body. So it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's much more than her just wanting to get fucked up. It's almost like she doesn't have access to something more sophisticated. This is like the best she can find. So she has to make do. Well, yeah, and the when she pours it on herself, I don't specifically remember that scene, but I'm sure that did happen. I mean, that's that's kind of like a ritual bathing, you know. So it was they, in the scene where she starts going, kind of starts dancing and like hallucinating. That's right. Yeah. Well, I I mean, I think that's valid, but again, I I I don't think it's either or. It's like problematizing that whole relationship to alcohol. Like, is she? I don't think it's suggesting that she's just a drunk, but on some level, you know, what is it? Like you you could apply the same thing to sexuality, right? Like, is it just whoring around or is it sacred sexuality? Like same thing with alcohol. Is she just boozing it up or, or does it have this, this uh, ritualistic sacramental aspect? I think, I think it's suggesting there's a bit of both, you know. Absolutely, but, uh, I think both. But yeah, she's definitely in contrast. Well, sorry, she's in contrast to a traditional religious monk figure, which we might see as living a very clean. I mean, her place is an absolute disaster. So she's see, living in this kind of squalor. Okay, yes, but see, well, yes. I mean, there's that. But see, again, I thought of a Korean connection. Remember when we met the great poet Gowen? Right, of course, of course. Who who himself was a Buddhist monk? I guess is a Buddhist monk. But as we know from the evening we spent with him, he loves his soju, doesn't he? Sure, and sure. and he, you know, uh, there. And I think like those Korean uh, shamans that I encountered on the mountain, I think alcohol was involved in their rituals too. You know, yeah. But that's why I'm I'm suggesting that beyond the alcohol we have other issues that would make it problematic to kind of give her the i don't know if the word is authority or the maybe inner peace that we might associate with uh a more elevated shaman you know because he used that word i mean she again she's well, very that, poor but i think that is i think that's a more realistic portrait right like the idealized shaman wearing robes and having a very almost like a Gandalf. <laughs> uh, yeah, Sorry. or well, I was thinking more. I was thinking more of like a you know Tibetan Lama or something like someone who's socially uh, b- part of the social elite and and like right. hierarchically respected and so on. She's right. not that at all, right? And uh, if you read like Joseph Campbell's books on primitive mythology i think it's in primitive mythology he talks about like how the shaman like there's a very fine line between outlaw and respected shaman right like many self-styled shamans never gain public acceptance they're just thought of as lunatics and maniacs and you know criminals criminals and and so that's a chance that every shaman or messiah or artist takes right like you you may never be accepted for what no, you and, think and is your, think everything you're is saying your gift. is yeah everything you're saying is like critical and and i agree i guess i just don't want to downplay the the suffering that she's experiencing i don't either you know? i want to elevate yeah. it i want to i want to point out that that is more the reality than the the you know socially okay and financially yeah. comfortable sure. religious figure that has the respect of the community i think she's more like the real deal in yeah. some ways even though yeah. yeah you know i mean as i was watching in a way i thought i felt ashamed of myself because it's like i don't suffer enough for my so-called art and my you know, what I'm, you could say my shamanic attempts to create, you know, like, I, I don't. Well, she doesn't seek out suffering, though, right? I mean, it's not like. 
Anyway. Well, yeah, but whatever, you know, she does accept it. She like whether reluctantly or not in the end, she does, she does take on that role of healer. Um, sure. And, uh, what did I want to say about that? But I guess you just wonder if oh, this is something, it's like her only means of, of, it's like her job. It's almost like a prostitute, you know? And I, I don't say that in a demeaning way, but it's like, this is how she knows to support herself. Cause she gets, right. She gets small each time she gets a different type of gift when she performs these services. Um, I wanted to ask you actually about the shoes that she receives from one of the people she helps. I think it was the people that she helped deliver the baby for. We see that her shoes are, are ruined early on in the film. And then she kind of attempts to repair them. But for the rest of the movie, she's kind of got these, these, Boots funky. that are that are not like a match. They're not a good. Yeah, exactly. Pair. And they're yeah. like roughly sewn together and patched up. Do you know? Do you have any theory for why she returns the nicer pair that were bought for her? Well, my my thought about it was, you know, I refuse to accept this kind of charity. You know, she she'll take money. She'll she had an interest in the musical instrument, which we can talk about. Yeah. Uh, a beautiful, it's called the Yakut violin. I looked it up. Uh, nice. I think the, the term is Kirimpa. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Oh, that's right. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's the, but it's, uh, yeah, it's a, a stringed, uh, it, it looks kind of like a lute, but it's a, but you play it with a bow uh, and it has a very haunting, beautiful quality. And, you know, that I think that's what we're hearing in the soundtrack. But she has an interest in learning to play. It's like something so mm. simple. She she is, in a way, a spiritual master. But she would what she would really like to do is learn to to uh, play this musical instrument, you know. She would right. if, if only someone could teach her how to play that, she would be happy, you know. But right. but but for whatever reason, the boots were just something she wasn't interested in. But I, yeah. I remember now what I wanted to say about the healing. Did you did you notice that the healing sessions? First of all, she she always demands privacy, right? Like mm -hmm. the, the people bring the sick patient or whatever, and then she says to everyone else, "Get the fuck out of here!" Basically, I'm gonna mm -hmm. I'm gonna work. But we we see we get glimpses of what she does, and to me, it's always vaguely sexual. Go on. Well, do you disagree? No, but I'd like you to kind of play it out further. Well, I think that I mean it's that's I, I think mean, there's, it speaks, a, I, there's a close proximity of the face. It speaks for right? itself. Well, she's you know like not only when she cures the impotence, but uh, you know, uh, well, think of the first time she summoned, uh, I think her friend at the police station calls her at the police station. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, a drunken, you know, vodka drenched man has mistakenly or perhaps not shot his wife in the stomach. Right. Something like that. Yeah. And, maybe and I she's allegedly he mistook her for a deer or something. Yeah, some crazy shit. And she's bleeding out. And so we see her, we see the shaman enter the room with her and she's like, get out. And we see her take off her top and she uh, yeah, climbs on yeah, top yeah, of yeah. this. She climbs on top of this woman. We don't see clearly what's going on, but she's like in her face, her long hair is hanging down. We We think that she basically sucks the blood out of some of these people. We see that later. Right. So it's a, so there's like a, a really, I mean, it's almost vampiric. It's like right. the Dracula connection between blood and sexuality. You know, v Dracula of course is a very erotic novel. Um, and there's a lot of sexual imagery at play in the Dracula myth, I would argue, 
and you know by extension the jesus myth right but also here with the shaman get into like that the, this being our the blood, episode the blood is the <laughs> get into life. the get into the yeah, jesus there you sexuality. Go. yeah well and the resurrection the e the erection is the resurrection don't you know every time nice. you every time you get hard you're you're uh you know granted new life it's That's true. my theory anyway but uh yeah i i mean i i'm not like i don't want to develop that into some theory i just noticed that all of the healing was very intimate and vaguely sexual sure. you know it's not it's and i i like the fact that it's not clear you know it's just like hmm th this is this is interesting it's like right it, how it are we supposed a, to interpret this a kind of carnal uh yeah intimacy that makes us uncomfortable right that's uncomfortable the, that's for sure thing. and that's you know that's that's what's great about this film. Like it, it shows, I, I think we're uncomfortable for a lot of reasons, like the, the alcoholism or whatever you want to call it, sacred use of, of alcohol, uh, the, the vaguely sexual nature of the healing, the ostracism, the, so, the social outcast, uh, you know, role that she plays all of the these poverty, things, the poverty, the, yeah. Uh, the and, cold and the cold it it makes us uncomfortable and i'm glad you know like we need to be made more uncomfortable we need to not you know take ourselves like too seriously and think that we have all the answers and we figured everything out we need to be confronted with these these uh powerful spiritual encounters you know we need to see this on film and read about these things and listen to music that discusses this kind of thing that's what i think i like it i like it yeah what else do you have in your notes that you could well of course this is you know as i learned this is the russian far east which we visited uh some listeners may know that you and I visited Vladivostok, which is the easternmost part of the Russian Far East, right? And this is, I didn't check the distance from Yakutsk to Vladivostok, I should have, but I did check the, and, and I should say, this is Siberia too. You know, the image we have of Siberia in America, or at least growing up in the Cold War, it's like, oh, Siberia, that's... That's where the dirty communists send all the bad people, you know, they just send them there to freeze their asses off, which, okay, yeah, there's that aspect of it. But Siberia is huge. You know, like I looked it up, Dostoevsky, who spent time in a Siberian prison, which he writes about in The House of the Dead, a book I read a couple of years ago. He was Me in, too. he was in Western you read it too? Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. I read so, it in Qatar. Yeah. So he was in, and one thing I remember about it is all the different types of people. Like there were Muslims in there as well as, you know, Orthodox Christians. There are probably some Buddhist folk in there, you know, some shaman, some uh, animistic religious folk. So that, that was one thing I remember about the narrative. But uh, I, I didn't remember this, but I looked it up. He was in Omsk in Western Siberia. Okay. And this mm -hmm. is four days by train from Yakutsk. So okay. that's how right. huge, that's how huge Siberia is. When we talk about, oh, Siberia, that's the cold place where they send all these people. It's huge. I mean, like you said, that just Yakut uh, is the uh, size Yakutia of India. is the size of India. And that's just a right. small part of Siberia. <laughs> It is right, insane. Right. We can't even conceive how massive this this land is, you know. But it is connected in that I'm sure it's cold as hell. Uh, to use a, a kind of oxymoronic uh, simile, right. but uh, 
you know, uh, that I, I was just overwhelmed by the vastness of it, you know, Siberia. And then to think that we went there and saw and saw firsthand that you're supposed to eat pickles with your vodka and what was it? Drink kvass and uh, what else did we do? Chips. They ate, would eat those greasy potato chips with the pickles and the vodka. Remember that? <laughs> Vaguely. I was just going to say I heard oh, this man. kind of not very – not the funniest joke I've ever heard, but I was just hanging out with some uh, some Russians at work, and they said the joke about a St. Petersburgian's awareness of geography is there's a, a big village somewhere called Moscow, and then there's a bunch of <laughs> – and then to the east, there's a bunch of, like, forests. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And then, and then there's St. Petersburg, like the which is the, the center of civilization, you know? Right. So and and just, all uh, of that, all of that is one country, you know, it's, it's crazy. Right. I mean, you, it's comparable to China, to the U S uh, just think of the, despite the uniformity imposed on the landmass by whatever social media, mass media, but I don't know. Think of the differences between, say, Florida and North Dakota or something. Or, right. I don't know, Boston, Massachusetts. Did I say Massachusetts? Massachusetts. You did. <laughs> and uh, Boston and, uh, I don't know, California, L.A. or something. Right, right. Or I, that maybe that's not the best example. I'm picking cities, right? But, say, Kansas and... And uh, I don't know, Phoenix, Arizona. Well, I think a lot of the more privileged big city folk in Russia, you know, they spend their holidays until recently. They would spend their holidays in Europe and Italy uh, rather than Russia. But now Russian tourism is starting to explode because people are having to stay in, inside the country, you know. So it's just kind of interesting how. And Lake Baikal. Like Lake Baikal yep, is Lake a Baikal. popular spot, mm -hmm. and that's near Absolutely. near. Is it actually in Saka? It's I'm close. not sure, but uh, it's yeah, close. one of my colleagues went there recently. It's definitely yeah meant to be beautiful. Yeah, um, well, that's you know, uh, a student of mine recently said that uh, Russia was part of Asia, like we were talking about Asia. Okay, name some Asian countries, right? And okay, China, Japan, Taiwan, Korea, and someone said Russia. I'm like, hmm, yes, although some might consider it part of Europe. Uh, it's Eurasia. That's kind of ambiguous. What do people there think? Like in St. Petersburg, do they say, yeah, we're I mean, Asian. it's a classic, it's a classic, like, talking point. You know, I... I I took a class once on Russian history is when I was studying in the summer at a university here. Yeah. And it's like almost a cliche, like almost it's like outdone, like whether Russia is Asia or Europe, you know? And, but I mean, kind of like, kind of like Turkey in that sense. I, I thought of Turkey when you said that. Yeah. But like a small, interesting note, like for example, Europe has kicked Russia out of a lot of it's like athletic alliances, athletic associations. So yeah. Russia would always play its football as in soccer against other European nations. But now because it's been banned, it's officially applied to join Asian conferences, you know? So that transition is happening and Chinese tourism here is starting to, to increase. But I persistently say that, especially places like St. Petersburg, like they, they feel much more brotherly and close to Europe. And that's why I feel a kind of sadness and regret, well, among other reasons, for, for the current political climate. Because I mean, if you look at St. Petersburg, and I may have already talked about this before, but it, the whole thing is built by Italians, you know? And, like, it's the influence of – I mean, it's it's a Christian nation. I guess that doesn't necessarily make it European. But, yeah, I mean, if we think about the place in the literary canon of Russian writers and – in the classical music canon, people like Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff. You know, I I do want, selfishly, I want Russia to be 
considered kind of part of the larger European landscape, but at the same time, like things change, you know, and have to get on with it. And well, if, can't it be if both? Russia like, takes a can, turn? can't it be part of the European conversation and the Asian conversation? Of course. Yeah. But I just mean, I get even just in terms of access of travel and so on, you know, it's, Oh yeah. It's well, that, if, that if is, St. Petersburg gets off the map. Of course know? that's, and it's, it's outrageous, you know, that, that, is currently the case we could talk for another hour about the reasons for that but right. i mean yeah it's it's disgusting you know like banning tchaikovsky and dostoevsky fuck you you know th what nonsense absolutely what nonsense uh <laughs> yeah i i have pretty strong feelings about that but um what else do we want to talk about? I mean, I think uh, I've uh, mentioned pretty much everything on my list here. Oh, I just found one more thing. What about the the uh, issue of obesity? Uh, as I as I was watching, I noticed like a lot of the characters in this film were. Mm you know, from a Western perspective, obese, fat. Right. You know, right. like, <laughs> like just say it, Mark. fat, you know, like, don't be a sensitivity reader. No, unashamedly. You know, I, you heard about that, right? Yes, of course. Yeah. The r roll doll nonsense. The word fat being taken out of roll doll books. Fuck anyway, that too. On. Fuck that too. Stop with the right. censorship, you idiots. But, <laughs> okay. well, I mean, they just, they're, you know that's who they are unashamedly i was thinking there's a of like, south texas vibe to it well san antonio <laughs> big I, women i was thinking charles charles barkley i don't know if you've seen I, didn't those even, clips. I didn't even know about that there's this running joke that charles barkley makes jokes about the big women in san antonio really and yeah, and it's like uh, he always gets in trouble for it, but he keeps doing it anyway. I love y'all got some big women out I there. I love Barkley, but I never heard him say that. I, I haven't been. Oh, uh, there's great compilations of paying, it online. Paying attention to him recently, we should actually do an episode on the text of Charles Barkley as a person, you know, or as a as a media figure or a, a pop culture icon. Anyway. Um, I have no, I read it. I read a biography about him called outrageous when I was, uh, like about 12 years old. And it was like, it was almost as influential as Malcolm X was to be later. So it, well, that's, that's it was great. very eye opening. I mean, he experienced a lot in his life. I'll, I'll save some of this for, uh, you know, a future episode in the hope that we actually do talk about Barkley, but I almost named my firstborn Barkley, or at least that was going to be his middle name. I we were going to say Chuck. We went with the no, no. It was going to be something Barkley, but uh, anyway, it, we we opted for a family name instead. But I'll Barclay's say that's kind of like a regal about. British name. That, that, that was what, that was what that was what I liked about it. Sir Barkley. Well, Sir, he was Sir Charles. Sir Charles, right? exactly. <laughs> but a, anyway, um, in the, in this film, you know, I was just thinking like. That that too gave it a very real gritty, naturalistic vibe, right? Like it it gave it authenticity. It's like these are not movie stars playing right, roles; right. these are real people Definitely. dramatically enacting these powerful scenes in this mystical drama, as it's called. But um, I I just wondered, like. You know, you we hear about these uh, sociological studies, like the I can't remember where it was, maybe the Marshall Islands or some remote place like that. They they started uh, airing Friends and other Western shows on TV, you know, and all of the okay. the, the girls who had been big, and that was like culturally the preference big girls right like every that was what was elevated by the culture but then you have all these western this skinny fetishism of the west being pumped in and then like all the girls got depressed and 
developed eating disorders and were like, oh, I don't look like Rachel on Friends. I don't look like whoever, Phoebe. Right. I'm almost well, embarrassed, interesting. embarrassed to say that I know the names. Of <laughs> yeah, the I, characters. I can't chip in on the Friends conversation. Monica. See, I know them all. And, and yeah, so I, I was just thinking about the remoteness of this place in that sense too, right? Like they're not exposed. And to, to some the, extent, maybe that extra, you need that extra layer in that, in the cold. Yeah. You, you know? need the, the, that whale blubber. Exactly. Get you through exactly. the winter. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. That makes sense. So anything Can we, else? We could talk a little bit about the ending, even if it is a spoiler. Um, mm -hmm. Spoil did away. Did you think, uh, okay. I mean, Liliana thinks that definitely wasn't her daughter because she says like that woman's a healer and she's sensitive to energies. So she would have picked up on what, on that being her daughter, but I couldn't tell, like, did you, oh. what impression did you have? Um, I thought it was her daughter, but she didn't want to admit it, you know, like, because she's a prostitute. Um, no, I don't think she necessarily, well, maybe, Although that's complicated. I don't know if she would necessarily feel ashamed of that. I think she just didn't want to uh, reveal her personal business to that guy that took her there. So she's like, okay, yeah, thanks, whatever, but that's not my daughter. That's not his business, right? So she's a private person. She just didn't want to let him think that he had helped her. Maybe she didn't want to owe him a favor, you know? Uh, there, there are a lot of reasons. But you don't, why. well, we didn't see any kind of, but so you don't think she even wanted to reunite with her daughter then and to like have a conversation Maybe not. With her? Maybe she just wanted to see her like, okay, that's, that's her. That's what she's doing. That's enough. Maybe she's embarrassed. Maybe she doesn't want to impose herself on her daughter. It could be, but we get the sense that there's a despondency that follows that scene that's possible uh, even before she's even before she's robbed by the the homeless guys that's that's possible i mean again i one of the strengths of this film is the ambiguity agreed yeah you know, absolutely we don't know what's really going on and that's great i love all these multiple interpretations that's why i think i would i would like to watch it again you know and i think she really if we had any lingering doubts i think she really cements herself as a heroic figure in her last act, right? Which is she'd been doing everything she could to avoid helping this one particular girl who was now in some state of coma, mm -hmm. right? And then she, she comes back after she's been robbed and she's seen or not seen her daughter. And she, she has completed her only like, mission in life which is again to resolve this question of her missing daughter mm -hmm. and so she's ready to die at that point and and she she commits this final absolution that's not the right word but right she she heals one more person and then and with that it's it's her her end see so. i i i think the ending the last shot is ambiguous too you you saw that as her death i'm not sure i mean there's a very disturbing image of her with a i'll just say it spoiler alert with a mouthful of blood and gore and who knows what else she took from this patient right but did she die or did she just pass out and you know drink some vodka afterwards and revive I don't think that's clear either. Although certainly mm. you could say she does die, but you, you use the word hero and she's definitely an heroic figure. I mean, mm. as we're saying this a martyr, right? A, a martyr. And yeah. in some, I mean, martyr means witness literally, but yeah. Um, she's a witness to the power of shamanism, Russian shamanism in the 21st century. That sounds like a great title for this episode. Well, and she's a witness to the cruelty of society. And, right? and the, and the 
failure to appreciate and recognize the gifts of the shaman and by extension the messiah the artist you know the you could even say the cassandra the prophetess that no one believes right like she predicts the future flawlessly and her curse is that no one will believe her you know you've got the gift of prophecy but no one will ever believe you that, right that's a right it's a, you know, that's a, a very old story, and we need to be reminded of that time and again. I, again, as we're talking about this, I, I'm just thinking, I want to watch this again, because there's so much I missed and so much that I could see a different way after talking to you. It's really a fantastic film. I'm not going to say it's like the best film I ever saw or my favorite, but it's a great piece of work, you know? Yeah, yeah, and it's as you said, it's... It's kind of nice that it's packaged in that 71 minutes, you know, it's a, it's a single viewing. Cause I know with our schedules and our, and our age, sometimes we don't, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's important. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. I mean, it's, it's nice to watch a shorter film from time to time. Yeah. It's like a novella instead of a novel right? You know, right. or a long short story. Mm -hmm. to use another oxymoronic descriptor. Anyway, we're bumping up on an hour here. I think we've done this film justice. Everyone should go watch it. If you're willing to provide the link, that's very of nice course. of you. Um, I think this was a great discussion too. And it, it excites yeah, me. Yeah, thanks, man. Because I, I feel like you're, you know, you're able to bring up a lot of ideas in a way that I kind of would struggle to. So yeah. Well, it excites me. I really, I want to visit Russia again as soon as possible. Welcome. Yeah. Welcome. Dobre pojalovat. Spasibo. <laughs> Look at that. Uh, so do you want to preview the next episode? We're, we're discoursing in Russian. Um, yes. The next text that we will focus on is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which Eleanor Roosevelt and some of her associates um, wrote, drafted, published under the auspices of the UN. Uh, it's a one-page document, so if you want to read it, you can find it online. If you want to read it before next week's episode, uh, that would be helpful. But we're going to explore that and talk about whatever comes up in relation there too. And I'll be recruiting some listeners this week to share their very brief opinions on this document. So uh, if you hear from me, please participate in our crowdsourcing for that episode. Sounds great. Have a good week, everybody. Yes, indeed. Bye-bye.